there is a town on the coast of Northern California. It's not particularly large, with a population of only 8,000 or so. You've probably never been there, but you might have heard of it, seen pictures of the beautiful redwood forest that shields it from the rest of the world, or maybe the craggy cliffs that separate it from the Pacific. The average person may never visit this last vestige of Americana, but for a brief moment, ten years ago, the entire country had its eyes on the little town of Night Falls, California. My name is Scott Sinclair. I'm a journalist. Well, freelance journalist, but that's not the point. I've always had a fascination with the more bizarre aspects of our daily lives. That strange feeling you get in your gut when you can't help but think something isn't right. Those moments when you enter a room and immediately forget the reason you walked in. What has always fascinated me the most, however, is how we as a society can care so much for so long about one specific thing and then suddenly eject that thing from our collective conscious. And I can think of no better example than hashtag what happened to Charlie. Now, I'm sure many of you listening right now have no idea what that hashtag is. Some of you might have this nagging feeling in the back of your head that you should know. Others of you still may be desperately trying to recall some distant memory, one sparked by those words, what happened to Charlie? Allow me to help. 10 years ago, Charlene Cooper disappeared from the sleepy town of Night Falls, California without a trace. The date is April 10th, 2009. Just like any other day, Charlie Cooper gets up at 6.30. She showers, brushes her teeth, does her hair, chooses her outfit for the day, just as any other 16-year-old girl would. At 7.45, she leaves the house in her car, a forest green 1996 Toyota Camry. At 7.58, she arrives at Nightfalls High, just in time for her first period, geometry. The day proceeds as normal, at first. She goes from period to period, class to class. She sits with her friends at lunch, nothing unusual. Then at approximately 12.30, in the middle of world history, she asks her teacher to send her home. She's not feeling well, she claims. Her teacher replies that her parents will need to be called in order to get their permission. Five minutes later, Charlie is sitting in the nurse's office, listening to the nurse making a call to her father. The conversation goes on for a few minutes. Suddenly, Charlie receives a text message on her cell phone. Before she could be stopped, she collects her things and runs as fast as she can out of the nurse's office, down the hallways of Night Falls High, out of the main doors, and into the parking lot she's never seen again. In the weeks that follow, the seemingly idyllic town of Night Falls becomes a media hot zone. What starts as one article about the disappearance quickly grows and transforms into a social media sensation. Everywhere you look, hashtag what happened to Charlie is popping up. People are talking about it on Twitter, Facebook, MySpace. Yes, MySpace was still a thing in those days. Remember that? Everyone is asking themselves where Charlie Cooper went. Did she run away? Was she kidnapped? Was she dead? Or was it something far, far worse? As time went by, it became more and more clear that, well, we didn't know. Her car hadn't moved from its space in the Night Falls High parking lot since the morning of her disappearance. After she left the school building, there was nobody who could reliably say they had seen her. Travis Warren, Charlie's boyfriend at the time, was brought in for questioning. He claimed he didn't know anything, and there was no evidence to prove otherwise. There was a small but vocal group who had assumed he had killed her, chopped her up and buried her in the forest, or maybe strangled her and then dumped her body in the ocean. These completely unfounded conspiracy theories added some fuel to the social media fire for a while, but eventually we all just had to face the facts. Charlie Cooper was gone, and we don't know where she went. Ten years later, here I am, thinking about Charlie, thinking about Night Falls, how does something like this change a town like that? Has it grown? Has it moved on? Or is it the same as it always was? A small, quiet town miles away from the nearest highway. A place you go for the weekend during a summer trip to wine country. I want to know. That's why I'm going there. I want to see the town, meet the people, talk to them, get to know who it is they really are and the effect that Charlie and her disappearance had on them. I'm going to Night Falls, California. I hope you'll join me. After a short flight and a long drive, I arrive in the little hamlet by the sea at around one in the afternoon. My first stop, the first gas station I can find to fill up my tank and empty my, well, you know. My second stop, though, is the Night Falls History Museum, located of all places in the family home of the town namesake Randolph Knight. As I drive up, I'm in awe of the building I see before me. It looks like something out of a fairy tale. 
Entirely wooden in its construction, it resembles an old German castle by way of M. C. Escher or perhaps Dr. Seuss. I stand beside my car, my mouth agape as I take in the towering spires and stained glass windows that make this structure look less like an ancestral home of a successful entrepreneur and town founder, and more like a child's drawing made real. After a brief moment, I look down and see a man approaching me. He is tall, a bit stocky, and his face is framed by thick round glasses, a beard that appears to be a few days overdue for a trim, and slicked back blonde hair. With one glance, I can pretty safely assume that this is my first contact here in town, Craig West, president of the Night Falls Historical Society and great-grandson of Randolph Knight. We shake hands. He thanks me for meeting him here. I tell him it's no trouble and thank him for agreeing to speak with me. I'm eager to learn more about his lovely town. He laughs. He asks if I'm hungry. I'm famished, I reply. He smiles and says, good, follow me. So this place was built as Randolph Knight's private getaway, turned into his family home. My parents make it into a B&B around 91. A few years back, I begged them to let me have the east wing of the house for the museum. And apparently I was irritating enough because they let me have it. We sit in a modest dining room by a long window overlooking the ocean. The clinking of plates and glasses resonates around us as several other people enjoy their lunches. The museum, Craig tells me, is also an upscale bed and breakfast complete with a dining room that is open for both lunch and dinner. So if you had to describe Night Falls in one sentence, what would you say? Ooh, good question. He leans back in his chair, arms folded. He thinks for a moment. As he does, a waitress brings us our food. I've ordered a bowl of clam chowder, while Craig receives a surprisingly large French dip. Thank you. Um, small but mighty, I guess. I, I know it's a cliche, but honestly, the, the people here are absolutely resilient. I mean, the last 50 years have been a complete roller coaster, and Night Falls has taken it all in stride, more or less. How's the food? Delicious, thanks. So, what do you mean by roller coaster? Hmm? You called the last 50 years a roller coaster. What do you mean by that? Oh, right, yeah. Well, uh, it's easier if I just start from the beginning, is that all right? By all means, please do. Thanks. So... Night Falls, founded in 1933 as a company town for employees of the Night Timber Company. Actually, I probably should go back a bit farther than that. Uh, would that be all right? Of course. Awesome. So, uh, 1902, New York. Five-year-old Randolph Knopf arrives from Germany with his parents, Werner and Margot. When they're going through processing at Ellis Island, they try telling the immigration agent their name. The guy just can't understand them. They try spelling it for him, get as far as K-N, when the guy just gives up and writes out Night. Boom. Just like that, Werner, Margot, and Randolph Knopf are now Werner, Margot, and Randolph Knight. Uh, now, the Knopf family had always been woodsmen back in Germany, so Werner moves his family to where business is booming, the Pacific Northwest. They float around back and forth between Oregon and Washington until, soon enough, Werner is a partner at a major logging company. When Randolph turns 18, he becomes his dad's apprentice and learns as much as he can about the industry. Uh, the next 15 years or so go by, and Randolph starts taking on more and more responsibility. In the meantime, he gets married, has a daughter, my grandma, and life is looking pretty good. Then the depression hits, and things aren't exactly cozy anymore. The company starts downsizing, laying off workers left and right. Werner and Randolph keep their jobs, but business definitely isn't good. Then in 1933, the New Deal happens, and the company gets a huge chunk of change from the government. Randolph is given the blessing of his father and business partners to spin off a bit of the company and make it his own. And so the Knight Timber Company is born. He doesn't want to compete with the people who taught him everything he knows, so he decides to move south to here. He sets up shop in the middle of the Redwoods and builds a lumber mill at the top of a waterfall in the middle of the forest. He builds the town to house his workers, and it just grows from there. When World War II breaks out, the government decides to set up shop and build an army base nearby, Fort Palmer, just in case. That brings a bit more business into town. When the war is over, the government changes their minds and shuts down the base. But a lot of the people stationed there decide to stay, or at the very least come back when they've left the service. So the town starts growing, little by little, but the timber company is still the backbone of the entire thing. Things are fine until Randolph loses it in 1962. Uh, he shuts down the timber company, dissolves its assets, and drops dead three days later at the age of 65. The will says that Grandma gets to keep the house and the land, with the one caveat that the lumber mill can never reopen and the forest can never be logged again. Throw in a bunch of other legal stuff, bad investments and hidden debt, and that means the family is basically penniless. The timber company is gone, which means that a large percentage of the population is out of work. 
You know, it's the end of the world as far as Night Falls is concerned. Some folks take up fishing, hoping to make something themselves and turn things around while they still can. Uh, for a while it works, but we're just too far from anywhere to build an entire economy around it. By the mid-70s, it looks like Night Falls is on its way to becoming a ghost town, until something miraculous happens. The wine industry explodes. Now, we're in no position geographically or financially to start a vineyard, but we are close enough to wine country to try to get people to come on up and visit. You know, take a nature hike, go out on the ocean, get away from the world. Tourism becomes our primary industry. People visit, they like it. Some love it and decide to stay. The town goes from a shadow of its former self to a little slice of paradise hidden in the middle of the redwoods in a matter of years. And that brings us to where we are today. Craig finishes his lecture, for lack of a better word, with a beaming smile on his face. It's abundantly clear that he's proud of his town, the people in it, and yes, the fact that he was able to get all that information out without skipping a beat or choking on his sandwich. Wow. what I tell you? Roller coaster. Roller coaster. I kind of had to gloss over some parts. Didn't want to bore you to death with the little details. I hope that's not a problem. Oh, no, not at all. You were very thorough. I got most of the important details in there, though, but I probably could just talk for hours if you let me. I don't think that'll be necessary right now. Another time, perhaps? Absolutely, anytime you like. Right. We continue our meal. Craig continues to share his seemingly endless supply of fun facts and obscure information about the area. After a while, the chowder is gone, the sandwich demolished, and we both stare out over the ocean for a few minutes. A waitress comes and takes our dishes. You save room for dessert? No, I'll pick something up later. Before I go, though, there is something else I'd like your perspective on. Shoot. Do you think Charlie Cooper is really dead? As I say this, the smile on Craig's face begins to fade. He looks down for a moment, then back out the window at the vast expanse of the ocean. You don't have to answer that if you'd rather not say. No, no, it's fine. You know, Charlie and I were friends back in the day. Really? Yeah. When she disappeared and they started searching the forest, I was out there every day looking for her. We never found anything, obviously, but I never really gave up. So no, I don't think Charlie's dead. She can't be. Her family's gone through so much that it just wouldn't be fair. Their daughter disappearing, all the news vultures hounding them for months, the whole business with Travis, the car crash, it's too much. It's been 10 years, so legally, yes, she's dead, but I don't want to believe it. The story can't end like that. Or, or maybe it can. Maybe it should. I don't know. At least there'd be some closure that way. I'm sorry, but you mentioned a car crash. I don't think I've heard about that during my research. Would you mind elaborating? Craig looks back at me. He smiles. Not the same beaming grin he's had since we met earlier today, but a small, defeated smile. One that hides years of pain and heartache. You know, I don't really think that's my story to tell. I'm sorry. You sure I can't interest you in some dessert? I'm fine, really. Suit yourself. Thank you for your time, Craig. I'm sure we'll be speaking a lot more soon. I do have to go, though. I'm meeting with someone. My name is Sydney Cooper, and I was 12 years old when my sister disappeared. I sit in a booth in the corner of the Redwood Diner. The general atmosphere is homey, and exactly what you'd hope for when picturing a small-town dining establishment. The lunch rush is past, and the place is practically empty apart from the staff. In front of me, a warm slice of their homemade cherry pie with a scoop of ice cream on the side. Across from me, a young woman, aged 22, her messy brown hair held back loosely by a series of rubber bands and the dark circles under her eyes are the only things that betray the calm and collected demeanor that Sidney Cooper presents to the world. Thank you for taking time out of your lunch to speak to me. Of course. Now, I know we discussed this a little over the phone, but I'd like to get your perspective on your sister's disappearance. Right. If at any point you feel like you're having a hard time, or if you just change your mind and would rather just stop the interview, just let me know. I'm sure this must be hard for you. It's not really. Not anymore, at least. I'm taken aback slightly at her bluntness. I begin to wonder if I made a mistake in setting up this interview. Sydney must see the apprehension on my face because she laughs and says, Don't be so surprised. Look, maybe that came out wrong. All I'm saying is that my sister disappeared when I was 12. I'm 22 now. I've lived a life without her practically as long as I lived a life with her. I've come to terms with it. I see. What do you want to know? Well, what was that day like for you? When your sister disappeared? It was just another day, really. We were all just 
going about our business that morning. I was in the kitchen having my cereal. I could hear my mom and Charlie upstairs yelling at each other over who was going to take me to school. My dad was just sitting on the other side of the table with his coffee, just shaking his head. I heard my mom say something about being late for work and then walking out the front door. My sister walked into the kitchen and told me it was time to go. I told her I wasn't done with my cereal and I didn't have my shoes yet. She just rolled her eyes and stormed out of the house. She slammed the door behind her. My dad and I looked at each other and just laughed. He took me to school that day. As Sydney retrieves these memories from the deep recesses of her mind, her hazel eyes begin to glimmer. They are windows, and behind them is a decade of misery and suffering. She seems to be looking back with a certain sense of nostalgia, reliving the final morning of her life that could ever be considered normal. She smiles, her happiness a relic reclaimed from the ancient tomb of her past. The rest of the day felt just as normal. My mom picked me up from school, drove me to dance class. You dance? I did. It started out as one of those things that my mom put me in because she thought it would be good for me, but I started to enjoy myself after a while. Pretty soon it was my life. My entire world was dance. I was gonna make it big. I had this dream that someday, somehow, someone important would see me dance and say, Kid, you're gonna be a star, and that would be it. We'd leave this town behind, and everything would be fine. I would be famous. My mom could quit waiting tables. My my dad, he would... I, I'm sorry, I got off track. Don't apologize. You don't want to hear about stuff that ever happened. It's fine, really. Whatever is easiest for you. No, you want to hear about Charlie. Let's talk about Charlie, okay? Okay. I didn't know anything was wrong until the next day. I woke up that morning to the sound of my parents arguing. My mom sounded like she was crying. Apparently she had been trying to call Charlie all night and wasn't getting an answer. I heard my dad trying to calm her down, saying that she was probably off with tr her boyfriend somewhere, and she didn't want to be bothered. My mom told him he should have called the police when he got to the school and she wasn't there. My dad said something about her being a teenager and that this wasn't the first time she had made plans without telling anyone, and he had a good point. I lost track of how many times I'd been woken up by Charlie sneaking back into the house in the middle of the night. Or out of it, for that matter. She wasn't particularly open about her social life. That didn't help my mom. She kept freaking out about the car. Charlie's car, I mean. She kept saying she wouldn't leave her car, she wouldn't leave her car. I think deep down my dad knew that she was right. Maybe he was in denial. Maybe he knew it wouldn't do Charlie any favors if they were both hysterical messes, so... He put on a strong face. He was good like that. It wasn't until Monday morning that my dad finally broke down and reported her missing. Your father waited three days to call the police? Like I said, I think he was trying to be strong. Like, that by admitting that something wasn't right, he'd be inviting the worst possible outcome? Do you think he should have called sooner? I don't know. I told you she wasn't open about her social life. For all we knew, she could have snuck off with her her boyfriend and been, well, they were kids. Stupid teenagers, you know? Uh-huh. So my dad called the cops. I think you know the rest of the story. Searching the forest, dragging Shadow Creek, interrogating suspects, that stupid hashtag. Right. So here we are. Here we are. How much longer do I have you for? I, I know you need to get back to work. I've got time. Besides, it's not like we're busy. She motions generally towards the empty tables and booths throughout the diner. Sure enough, not a single soul has entered for the duration of the interview. If one of Sydney's co-workers hadn't come and taken my plate after I finished my pie, I would say the diner was deserted. I feel as though I've gotten enough information to call this interview a success, but there are a couple of things nagging at me. Things that I could put off for later, but would drive me crazy if I did. And so I say, perhaps against my better judgment, there are two more things I'd like to discuss before we go, if that's alright. I suppose. During my conversation with a previous source, let's say, they made mention of a car crash. I haven't heard about this in my research, and I was just wondering if you could- Did Craig tell you? Um. He did, didn't he? I'm not really at liberty to- I get it. You're a reporter. He was probably just trying to help. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have brought it up. It's fine. Yes. There was a car crash. April 10th, 2013. Four years to the day after Charlie disappeared. My dad- smashed his car into a giant sequoia in the forest near Shadow Creek Bridge, died instantly. 
If you go up there, you can still see the gashes in the tree where they pried the car loose. My mom lost what little of her mind she had left. I dropped out of school and took over her shift here at the Redwood. I've been taking care of her ever since. Oh my god. I had no idea. And now you do. What else? What else? You said there were two things you wanted to discuss. What was the other thing? It's really not important. I'm not upset, just say it. I... I wanted to discuss Travis Warren. At the mention of that name, her face changes. She tries to hide it, but the cracks in this persona she's built for herself are starting to show. She quickly glances around the diner, as if saying his name would somehow cause him to manifest, but then looks back. What about him? Really, it can wait. What is it you wanted to know? Do you believe he killed your sister? As soon as I say it, I regret it. Sydney stares blankly. It's clear that she expected the question, and maybe she was convinced she was ready to talk about it. She looks down. Her hands begin to fidget. She tries her best to hold them back, but I can just barely see the tears beginning to well in her eyes. If I could take back the question, I would. Suddenly, she wipes her eyes and looks back at me. The facade of the girl who doesn't care anymore has returned. Her face has the same cool, collected look as it did before, but there's a slight quiver to her voice as she says, I don't want to believe it. After finishing my interview with Cindy Cooper, I make a quick pit stop to check into my motel. It is a small family-run establishment located right on Main Street. The young woman behind the desk hands me my room key, a small bottle of water, and a map of Night Falls. I deposit my luggage in the room and sit on the bed, inspecting the map. It's a large piece of paper, folded in on itself a few times. Clearly put together by the town's tourism board, the map highlights several small businesses around Night Falls. I take note of a few places I hope to check out in the next few days. A used bookstore with a coffee shop in the back, a little fast food restaurant advertising fresh-made steak, burgers, and hand-cut fries, various antique shops and knick-knack stores. I'm here for work, but I might as well see everything the town has to offer, right? Looking over the map, I notice that there are two roads leading out of Night Falls. One goes east, the other goes north. The eastern road connects the town to the freeway, about a 15-minute drive. The northern road, however, leads to the site of my final interview for the day. I make my way north, driving for about 20 minutes until the paved road gives way to a gravel path. After about five minutes of bumpy driving, I arrive at my destination, the junkyard. A wooden sign painted with the words Warren Auto Salvage hangs on the gate of the chain link fence surrounding the property, greeting me as I drive up. Beneath it, a smaller sign reading business hours 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., closed Sundays and Christmas. I look at my watch and sigh. Ten minutes after six. I get out of my car and walk up to the gate. Peering through it, I see a small mobile home that looks like it was put here in the 70s and hasn't been moved since. The word management is painted on the door. I call out. I get no response. I try again with the same results. I look at the gate and give it a slight push. It swings open, letting out a groan. I make my way up to the house and knock on the door. I wait a moment and raise my hand to knock again when I hear a voice from inside, a man's voice. Yards closed, it says. I'm looking for Travis Warren, I shout through the door. We spoke on the phone. I have an interview with him. The building creaks as I hear footsteps making their way towards the door. There's the noise of hands fumbling with the lock, then the door opens slightly. Immediately, I'm overwhelmed by the scent of cigarettes and cheap whiskey. A pale face peers out from the crack in the door. It stares at me, looks me up and down, then says, Oh yeah, come in. I'm sorry about the mess. I've been really busy and didn't have much time to clean it up. I sit on a musty old couch watching Travis Warren scurry about picking up various fast food wrappers and empty bottles, attempting to deposit them in an overflowing garbage can. He still looks very much like the 18-year-old kid whose picture was all over the news 10 years ago, albeit with a more tired expression and an overall appearance that could be described as generally greasy. He pulls two glasses from the kitchen sink, sniffs them, shrugs, and then grabs a mostly empty bottle of what I can only assume is whiskey from a cupboard. Can I get you something? Drink? No, thank you. All right. He deposits one of the glasses back into the sink and pours the bottle's contents into the remaining glass. He holds the bottle upside down for a moment, attempting to get the last few drops of liquid out, then walks over to the trash. He uses the bottle to push the various pieces of refuse further into the bin, then places it daintily on top. He walks over to the wooden chair opposite me and sits. He places his glass on the cluttered coffee table separating us and reaches for an ashtray filled with cigarette butts. 
He looks through them until he finds one that is only partially smoked. He puts it in his mouth and produces a lighter from his pocket. All right, if I smoke? Go ahead. Thanks. So what's this for? Paper? Something like that. Well, buddy, I'm not going to be able to give you anything more than I've been saying for ten years. I understand, but I'm not exactly looking for information. No? Then what? I'd like some perspective. Your perspective. On Charlie's disappearance. You want to know if I killed her? No, actually, I, I just... Chopped her up. Buried her in the woods. That's what they say, right? Well, yes. Because I definitely didn't do that. I don't think you did. Of course not. I actually brought her back here and put her through the crusher. She's out there right now, somewhere in the junk heap. I sit dumbfounded and slightly scared, staring at Travis as he knocks back the remnants of his drink. He looks back at me with wide, bloodshot eyes. His greasy hair frames his face like dark curtains pulling back to reveal a wild man. The corner of his mouth begins to twitch when suddenly... <laughs> I'm just fucking with you, man. I... um... What? It's a joke. Come on, it's funny. I don't really see how. You gotta laugh, because you'll cry if you don't, right? Right. So you wanted... what was it? Perspective? If that's alright with you. Yeah. Why not? Travis takes one last drag of his cigarette before depositing it back in the ashtray. He sifts around in it for a moment, frowns, then puts the tray back on the table. So how much do you know? I know the basics, but I want to know your side. My side. My side, my side, my side. Let's start with why you're brought in for questioning. Sure. Good a place as any. Simple. I was the prime suspect. The boyfriend is always the one who did it, right? I suppose. You were closer to Charlie than anyone, right? I mean, I guess you could say that. Tell me about your relationship. What, like, all of it? If you'd like. Shit, man. Sure. Um, How did you two meet? School. Next question. I sit awkwardly, trying to think of what I can say or do to bring this interview on track. I consider coming back some other time when Travis is sober. Looking at my surroundings, and at Travis himself, I get the feeling that might be easier said than done. There's something morbidly poetic about the circumstance that Travis Warren has found himself in. Stuck in a junkyard. A place where things that once roared with life and limitless potential now sit in disrepair, waiting until the day they wither away into nothing more than a pile of scraps. The man who sits before me is every bit as broken as the vehicles littered about outside. How about we start over? From the beginning. Whatever you say, boss. Let's start with you. Who is Travis Warren? Tell me about him. As I say this, Travis seems slightly surprised. I get the feeling that nobody has shown any interest in him personally for quite some time. Oh, wow. Um, well, let, let's see. I'm 28 years old, and I've lived in Night Falls my entire life. Is that unusual? I mean, kinda, I guess. You know, a lot of kids graduate from Night Falls High, leave town for college, and never come back. But some people like it here and decide to stay. And you decided to stay. You could say that. It wasn't really my choice at first. Kind of hard to leave town and start a new life if you got no cash. And it's kind of hard to get cash if everyone thinks you're a murderer. I suppose that's true. I don't really mind it, though. Everyone thinking you're a murderer? No. Well, no, I'm, I mean staying here. And why is that? Well, it's my home, I guess. But would you leave if you had the means? Yes. I'd like to move on to Charlie, if that's all right with you. Sure. Yeah, that's fine. What about Charlie? Tell me about her. About the two of you. Travis thinks for a moment. His eyes seem to look into infinity as he works his way back ten years through a haze of booze and God knows what else. Well, like I said, we met at school. She was a freshman. I was a junior. We shared a science class. I think it was biology? Yeah, biology. I had to retake that one a few times. You know, I can take an engine block apart and reassemble it with my eyes closed, but as soon as you put a textbook in front of me and start asking me about cells and chromosomes and that shit, my brain goes out the fucking window. Charlie got put as my lab partner one day. She was smart. I think Miss... Miss... What the fuck? Uh, the teacher, 
I think she was hoping that Charlie would help me along until I could get the hell out of her classroom. And you know what? It worked. Something about her, the way she explained everything, it just clicked, you know? She broke things down in a way I could understand. You know, looking at diagrams like, okay, this is your motor, your transmission, your fuel line, so on and so on. We stayed lab partners for the rest of that year. I asked if she wanted to go out sometime, and she told me if I got above a C on the midterm, she would think about it. And you know what? I did. B minus. We went out for steak burgers at Jimmy's, then we went and walked up and down the coast for a bit. I took her home right after, no funny business. She kissed me that night. She sounds like a sweet girl. She is. She was. I mean. How was the rest of your relationship with her? It was good. It was really, really good. She deserved way better than me, but there was no way in hell I was going to let her realize that. Charlie brought out the best in me. She brought out the best in everyone, really. Like, imagine there's a certain amount of goodness in the world, right? Imagine if that all got squeezed down and made into a single person. That was Charlie. Well, for me, anyway. The way you talk about her, it sounds like she was perfect. She was to me. I mean, yeah, there were some rough spots and we got into trouble sometimes, but we were kids, man. You know how it is. What kind of trouble? Oh, nothing bad. You know, we'd sneak out together and drive up and down the coast in the middle of the night. Her parents didn't like that. And did her parents like you? I think they liked me as much as anyone can like someone who's dating their daughter, you know? I think they saw that Charlie was happy and they tolerated me for it. Mostly. They dropped the, uh, image of liking me whenever they caught her sneaking in or out of the house. Calling me a degenerate. Saying I'd be the death of her. Leave the grease monkey kid in the garage where he belongs. Stuff like that. Me dropping out of school probably just reinforced their opinion. Did that make you angry? Dude, I agreed with them. Newsflash, I don't think too highly of myself. What about Sydney? Oh man, Sydney was a cute kid. Really sweet. Just like Charlie. A bit of a brat sometimes, but she was the kid's sister, you know? That's kind of a given. But we got along well. There were a few times where Charlie got stuck babysitting her, so I'd come over and watch movies with them or bring them to my dad's garage and work on some cars. Charlie watched, mostly, but Sydney liked to get up in there and see what was going on under the hood. Good kid. Really good kid. Have you seen her recently? Yeah. Small town. Kind of hard not to. Are you still friends? No. She has a hard time talking to me. Even looking at me. I don't blame her. Why do you think that is? Imagine you were her. Your sister starts dating this guy. You think he's really cool and stuff. One day your sister disappears, and everyone says that that guy killed her. Even if you didn't believe it, that'd be stuck in the back of your head for the rest of forever. Did you ever try to reconnect? Maybe explain your side of things? Once. After her dad. I tried to go over there and see if there was anything I could do to help them out. I walked into the house. Her mom saw me and had a meltdown. She was screaming and crying, yelling at me about Charlie. Sydney tried calming her down, but I think we both realized that it'd be best if I just stayed out of the picture. As Travis shares these memories with me, I see a tear rolling down his cheek. I don't think he notices, or if he does, he doesn't care. I don't mention it to him. I'm happy to continue playing the part of therapist. Would it be all right if we discuss the day of the disappearance? Travis wipes the tear from his cheek. He shakes his head, as if to bring himself back to the present. Um, yeah. Yeah, that'd be fine. Take me back there, from your perspective. Yeah. Sure, okay. So, it was a couple of months after I dropped out. My dad had broken his arm fixing an old Thunderbird and he couldn't work. So I left school to sort of take his place at the garage. Like I said, my dropping out was a big point of conflict for Charlie and her parents. Charlie didn't care since she thought I was doing it for the right reasons. Her parents weren't convinced. They started fighting more and more. Well, it was mostly her mom. 
anyway, one day, April 10th, I wake up to a text from Charlie. Do you love me? It says. Really random question to ask first thing in the morning. So I text back, yeah, of course I do. She asks me if I could pick her up from school at 12.30. I ask why. She says something like, I'm done with this town, I'm leaving, and I want you to come with me. I guess she'd had another fight with her mom and it was just too much for her. I tried talking her out of it. You know, I couldn't leave. I needed to help my dad. Finally, she wore me down and I said I'd be there. My car was acting up that day, so I was a little bit late. I got there at like 12.45. I texted her that I was outside and she said she'd be right there. I waited 15 minutes. I texted her a couple more times and didn't get an answer. I figured that she got caught and they confiscated her phone. I stuck around a little bit longer until the security guy told me I needed to leave. Someone saw you on campus the day she disappeared? Yeah. Back then, I was driving this beat-up POS truck that I'd gotten back up and running myself. Looked pretty shady, I guess. Guess that's why security didn't want me hanging around. Come to think of it, that's probably why they brought me in for questioning. What about that weekend? Charlie wasn't reported missing for three days. What were you doing during that period? Lying low, mostly. Every so often, Charlie and her mom would go at it so much that she'd ask me to stay away for a few days until things calmed down. I figured this was another one of those times. I didn't realize that she was missing until it was on the news Monday night. As Travis finishes his thought, he starts to sway a bit in his chair. He puts his head in his hands and rubs his temples for a moment, groaning. Hey man, I'm really sorry, but I just got the biggest headache just now. Would it be alright if we, you know, call it a day? Of course. You've been extremely informative, Travis. Thank you. No problem, man. It was good to talk to someone about this stuff. Can I get you anything? A glass of water? Nah, I'll be fine. It'll pass in a minute, probably. Would it be okay if we met again at some point? I'd love to hear more from you. Sure. Why not? You know where to find me. Travis, still rubbing his head, walks me to the door. I thank him again for his time and make my way back to my car. The sun is beginning to set now. I hear a loud thump come from inside the mobile home, probably from Travis collapsing on the couch. I look back and shake my head. Such a waste. I get in my car and drive back to the motel. I've had a big day. I've got a lot to process. The following morning, I head to Vortex Books, the bookstore with the coffee shop in the back, for my morning cup of coffee. The atmosphere inside is cozy, if not slightly offbeat with stacks of books scattered throughout the establishment. I make a mental note to come back here and explore some more. With my coffee in hand, I make my way to the cemetery. A missing person is declared legally dead after seven years, and Charlie Cooper is no exception. On the seventh anniversary of her disappearance, the town donated a memorial grave marker, which was installed next to the grave of her father, Bill Cooper, in the Night Falls Cemetery. After a few minutes of searching, I'm able to find the marker. It's a small, unassuming bronze plaque. Charlene Meredith Cooper, it reads. Born October 7th, 1992, disappeared April 10th, 2009. Beneath that, a small inscription. Lost, but forever found in our hearts. I take sips of my coffee as I stare at the marker. A cool breeze blows gently through the air. I try to wrap my head around everything I've learned. Yesterday, it felt like I had made so much progress. But now, in the light of a new day, I realize I haven't even begun to scratch the surface. I need to dive deeper into this story, schedule more interviews, explore the town, get to know everyone and everything Night Falls has to offer. I shake my head. I've scheduled interviews for the rest of the week, but something tells me they won't be enough. I continue gazing at the plaque. At Charlie's name. What am I doing here? Standing in the middle of a graveyard with my morning coffee, looking at a marker for a girl who may not even be dead. I'd hoped that coming here would make me feel, in some macabre way, inspired. Instead, I just feel... ridiculous. To be completely honest, I started looking into this case for purely selfish reasons. I wanted to be the journalist who solved Charlie Cooper. Wouldn't that look great on a resume? Hashtag what happened to Charlie has always held this mythic status in my mind. I know that it happened, but it never felt real. Until yesterday. Talking to the people who were forever changed by this event brought me back to reality. To them, it isn't just a story. It's their lives. I feel dirty, almost. Like I've been taking advantage of their suffering for my own personal gain. 
I suppose in some way I have been. I realize now something that I should have known from the start. I can't do this for myself. I have to do it for them. For Charlie. Maybe coming to this graveyard has inspired me after all. As these thoughts race through my head, I see something strange. A large white speck drifts lazily down towards the bronze plaque. Then another, and another. I look up. The sky is full of them. It's snowing on the California coast in the summer. I stare in disbelief. A flake lands on my cheek and I instinctively brush it away. I look down at my fingers and see a large black smudge. This isn't snow, I realize. It's ash. I look around me in all directions to see if there are any signs of a fire in the distance, but the sky is clear. I breathe deeply and can smell no smoke. Ash is falling from the sky for no apparent reason. As I stand alone in the graveyard, looking dumbfounded, all across town, people are having similar experiences. Cars stop in the middle of the road as their drivers get out for a better look at the impossible precipitation that Night Falls is currently experiencing. Sydney Cooper, halfway through her morning shift at the Redwood, spills coffee on a diner's lap as she is distracted by the scene outside. Craig West is walking some visitors to the museum when he realizes that everyone is looking towards the window. He joins them, staring in awe. Travis Warren does not see the ash falling outside. In his mobile home in the junkyard, he awakes with a start. He hasn't moved from the couch where he drunkenly passed out after my interview with him. He moans and rubs his head. The migraine he was experiencing last night still persists, made worse by the unwelcome addition of a hangover. His head throbbing, he stumbles his way into the bathroom. He opens his medicine cabinet and knocks bottles off the shelf as he looks for something to dull the pain. He finds a bottle of aspirin and attempts to open it. The pain in his head is intensifying, a sharp, piercing pain that shoots through his head like feedback through a faulty speaker. He drops the bottle in the sink and clutches his head, screaming. His body begins to tense up. He loses his balance and drops to the floor. He tries to stand, but he cannot move. The pain gets worse and worse and worse. He begins to convulse and seize on the floor. He cries in agony as his body flails uncontrollably. Then, suddenly as it began, the seizure stops. His headache is gone. Travis stands, shakily. He turns on the sink and splashes some water on his face. He stares at himself in the mirror, and in that moment, he knows the truth. Through some unknown means, Travis Warren knows, in that single moment, the answer that no one has been able to find for 10 years. Charlie Cooper is alive, and she's coming home. Night Falls, California is a production of Night Falls Media. Episode 1, A Town on the Coast, was written and directed by Alexander Gregg and Robert F. Wilson, with original music by Tyler Tingey. This episode features Robert F. Wilson as Scott Sinclair, Alexis Ross as Sidney Cooper, Alexander Gregg as Craig West, and Harrison Langford as Travis Warren. Want to know more? Visit us at nightfallsmedia.com, where you can find new episodes, links to our social media, and information on how to support the show. Thanks for listening.